everybody, Realm Builder Guy here, and welcome back to the channel, and welcome to my latest Crusader Kings 3 guide. This is part one of a two-part guide series focused on one of the core mechanics of CK3, namely the military. Here in part one, I'm going to focus on armies, and in part two, it's going to be about combat and warfare. So, before we get into part one, uh, thanks again for all the likes, comments, subscriptions, and so forth. Please don't forget to hit that like button. It really helps a small and growing channel like mine get seen and rated by YouTube and helps with the further growth. I hate doing this kind of stuff before the videos, but it is unfortunately very, very important. So, don't forget to hit that like button. I don't know, maybe if we can get to 150 or 200 likes on this video, that would be pretty impressive. So anyway, uh, without much further ado, let's get into part one of the CK3 military guide. So what you can expect in this guide is I'm gonna go through the different types of units and entities in the armies, as well as some things that impact the armies uh, and the units be that uh, the terrain or supply, attrition, you name it. So anyway, the first things first, we need to get a few of the stats right. The first stat I need to talk about, of course, is strength. And that is the number you see next to this little icon here. And that's the total number of troops. Next, you have damage. Damage is the, well, damage that the unit deals Toughness is the next one. Toughness is the resistance to said damage. Then we have these two little stats right here. We have Pursuit, which is the damage caused during the retreat phase. And then Screen, which is the resistance to damage during the retreat phase. So those are the main stats that your military units will have to be measured upon or against. Now, as far as the units go, we're going to just go kind of chronologically through here a little bit. First off, we have levies. Levies will be the largest part of your armies. They are conscripted from the peasants that make up the bulk of your troops. They are by far the weakest troops. As you can see here, 10 damage, 10 toughness, no pursuit, no screen. So that means when they are facing an opposition that is retreating, they do no damage and if they are being routed and retreating, they get slaughtered. So yeah, they are the stormtroopers of CK3. But um, they are the cannon fodder, but they are also free. That's the nice thing here. You can see this little icon here. How much gold do they cost? Nothing. Raised, unraised, they are absolutely free, which is definitely not the same that we can say about the guys down here that we're going to talk about in a minute. Next, we're going to move over here to knights. Now, the knights are your elite soldiers, your elite fighters. And they come from multiple different parts of your court, but they have to be courtiers or vassals and or vassals. But they are in your court, in your realm. These are special people here. We have Ryaset. As you can see, he has an 18 prowess. Now, what does prowess mean? Now, the combat stats that I mentioned before are based on this prowess skill. One prowess equals 100 damage and 10 toughness. So he has 18. So that's 1,800 damage and 180 toughness. So these guys are really tough, and they will decimate the opposition. Now, obviously, if the opposition has a bunch of knights, well, you'll have some interesting meetings here. Now... I have recruited a lot of key knights here, so we've got a pretty stacked group of solid, solid knives here, uh, knives, knights here in the Kingdom of Brittany. But if you do not have enough knights, you can always invite knights. Uh, inviting knights does cost prestige. Uh, the other thing that it does, that once you have invited them to your court, you then need to recruit them, which costs gold. Now, you've got three different buttons here, three different options you can click. Forbid, Allow, and Force. I hardly ever use Force, but forcing someone to be a knight could be an in interesting tactic. If you have someone that you don't really like, that really doesn't like you, if we look at Count Erlion of Bayeux, 
Now, he's a okay, he's not a great knight, but I could force him to be one of our knights. He doesn't like me very much. And uh, the, the tactic behind that is force him into your ranks as a knight, and there's a chance he could get killed or captured in battle, uh, which would be a great way to get rid of an opponent internally. Now, the other thing is, of course, you have forbid. Now, you can forbid people that are just, you know, really, really bad. As you can see here, my husband, I can forbid him, which would be very important because you don't want key critical members of your court, especially your heir, to die in battle. And, of course, as a knight, there is a significantly higher chance of them dying in battle. So next, we're going to move down here to men at arms. Now, these are your trained professional troops. Now, you have a limited number of regiments, but each regiment can be increased in size. So you can see your men-at-arms. Here's a number. That's how many regiments. We've got a regiment limit of six here with Brittany because the queen has a plus four, plus we have learned mustering grounds and household soldiers. So that all adds more regiments we can add. But otherwise, usually you'd have three or four, maybe five is pretty average. Six is is on the little bit higher side at this point in the game. Um, now, uh, like I said, you can add, say we have six here, we can do six different regiments, but then you can increase your regiment size. You can see here we've got 300 light footmen, 200 bowmen, 200 pikemen, 100 light horsemen, and 20 mangonels. I will talk about that in a second. So, um, your... Men-at-arms regiments are paid for in gold if you are feudal or clan, or via prestige if you're tribal. Again, prestige is probably, in my opinion, uh, that's piety, sorry, prestige is, in my opinion, by far the most important commodity in Crusader Kings 3, for so many different reasons, regardless of what you are playing, whether you are a clan, feudal system, tribal, you name it. This is such an important um commodity or um yeah let's call it a commodity resource resource let's go with resource that you can have because you also need it to declare wars we'll talk about that in part two of course now each type counters another type if we look at our light footmen here now they are skirmishes they counter heavy infantry which is great because you're also an infantry type um then you have associated unraised and raised costs you keep an eye on. Right here, if I lock them in again, unraised maintenance, 0.33 gold per month, full maintenance, 0.99. So basically one gold per month. And all of them have different costs. The more elite a troop is, the significantly higher that cost goes. So if we say, let's do Armored Horsemen here, you can see the full maintenance is 1.55 per month for a single unit. That's, that's very, very high. So those are costs you always have to keep in mind. Now, this next point is something I cannot stress enough. It is, it is absolutely critical in Crusader Kings 3. And that is you must have siege weapons. Again, you must have siege weapons. Now, they do not fight in battles, but are critical for sieges. Never, ever, ever leave home without them when you're raising your armies. With They reduce the time for a siege significantly, and I'll get into the importance there in a second, with an example here I had with this Brittany campaign. Now, onagers are the, or onagers, I'm not 100% sure how that's pronounced, are the base model. But if you're culture head, then focus on mangonels as fast as possible because, well, their siege effectiveness is just higher and you can siege down opposition holdings significantly quicker. Now, why is that important? Now, I'm going to do an example here of early on in this campaign with Brittany. It was still a duchy at that point. And we had the combined forces of uh, Anjou, Poitou, Aquitaine, uh, Toulouse, and so on, that desperately, desperately wanted the um, province of Nantes, or the county of Nantes. They came in with a two-to-one force. They had about 6,000. I had about 3,000 troops at that time. This is still relatively early on. 
they came in through Anjou and took on Nantes right away. So I moved around them in a pretty wide arc to kind of get around them and drop down here. And I started sieging the capitals of the different duchies and counties that declared war upon us. Now, because I had a general with the right kind of traits and I had mangonels already, I knew that I was better equipped for sieges than the opposition because my opponents didn't really have, they still had basic siege equipment and no army leaders, no commanders that had significant enough attributes. So I was sieging down holdings at a rate two to three times faster than they could siege down in my own realm. And as such, the war score started ticking significantly in my advantage. Now, they got Nantes, then they moved to Vannes, and then uh, Pontievre, and they sieged those down. But I had sieged down so much here. I was already at about 80% war score, and then I just came back and started sieging these back. In the meantime, they broke off to, bes to get back the areas that I had besieged. But by the time they got even over there, I'd already got Nantes back, then I was working on Van. At the end of the day, I won a war against a two to one superior force because I invested heavily in siege warfare equipment as well as traits for my army commander. That made a huge difference. So that would be my recommendation there. That's why, again, you must have siege weapons. So the next thing here is, of course, what kind of army composition makes sense. Now, my favorite composition is something you kind of see right here. I've got uh, three different regiments or 300 light footmen. Why light footmen? They're cheap. They're not bad. The nice thing is, and I'm going to get into terrain effects here in a minute, they have a lot of advantages. So forests, taiga, and jungle, and no disadvantage terrain. Then I add about two bowmen again here. Advantage in hills, forests, and taiga. No disadvantage. And they are good against skirmishers. Again, light footmen. Opposition is going to have a lot of light footmen. They're at a reasonable price. Then I usually add one, maybe two light horsemen. Now, wh why only one to two? Well, I mean, the good thing is they counter the archers. Very, very important. They have an advantage in plains and drylands, but they have negative disadvantages in hills, mountains, desert mountains, and in wetlands. And they're relatively expensive, so keep an eye on that. And then adding, you know, one to two uh, or 200 pikemen. Why? Because they're especially good against cavalry, both light and heavy. And they have advantage in mountains, desert mountains and hills. Again, these are areas where your cavalry units have disadvantages. So they ha already have an advantage. They counter cavalry and they get a terrain advantage in the areas where, in the terrain where the cavalry has a disadvantage. And they're not overly expensive. So that's a basic army composition that I utilize. Plus, again, you must have siege equipment. So now you may have access to special men at arms that are based on cultural or regional differences. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but different areas have different names for different types of units. If you have access to it, then consider using those over these regular types. They tend to be a little bit stronger. Sometimes they're significantly more expensive, but not all the time. Sometimes it's the same cost. If it's the same cost, just go for the one that's better. Keep an eye on, we look at it here, the different stats, how they compare to each other. Make sure that you are not too heavy in one area, that you're well balanced. You've got good damage, good toughness, good pursuit, and good screening based across your entire army. So you're not too heavy in one area over the next because, yeah, it's great if you can, del you know, give a lot of damage, but if you're not very tough, you're going to break down pretty quickly. Or if it, you happen to be in the retreat phase and you've got your screen is really low, like Bowman just doesn't have any protection there because they don't use armor, and a lot of your units are bad in that, you'll get routed really, really fast and the damage will be significant. It'll be very hard for you to rebuild and recruit fast enough. So the other thing is, and I already mentioned this, keep an eye on terrain as some are better or worse in certain types of terrain. 
example, cavalry tends to have disadvantages in mountains, hills, and wetlands like I talked about. And like I talked about, pikemen have advantages in those types of terrains. Archers have them in hills. So if facing cavalry heavy armies, trying to engage in disadvantage, disadvantageous terrain with units that are good against them. So try to balance that out. You can see the army composition of a few of the armies and a few of the areas around you just to kind of keep an eye on it. If we look at, oh, let's look at France here. You can see his army and you can see right there, light footmen, heavy horsemen, armored footmen, horsemen, but you can see Manganels, he has 10. So we are better equipped already at uh, siege warfare than they are. They don't have a ton of men at arms. They have a crap ton of levies. So if you're going to get engaged with this uh, army and you're close enough, say you've got 5,000, they've got 6,000, but it's very levy heavy and you have significantly more men at arms, you're probably going to win that simply because you have a higher quality of army. And as such, you're going to de give deal. That's the word I'm looking for. Deal a ton of damage and not take a lot. If on top of that, you have a good focus on siege equipment, you will win there too. Now, the next thing I want to talk about are special soldiers. I've mentioned them a few times, especially in 867, when you look at who at that time was the Count of Montague, and that is Heston. Now, special soldiers are maintenance-free armies. So again, they don't cost this. They're like levies in that sense, but they do not reinforce. When they're gone, they're gone, and they're only attached to certain historical characters. In 867, there are three of them, all of them Viking, Heston, Halfdan, and Ivar. In 1066, we have a few more, Bilma, Rohana, William the Conqueror, Harold of Norway, and Harold of England, and the Selchuks all have special units. Some are actually inherited. So if William dies, some of his special units get inherited to his son, and they get passed on until they are completely off the board. So that is something that can happen. So just keep an eye on special soldiers. Don't be too scared by them. Just be aware of them. The next set of units are, of course, mercenaries. Now, mercenaries can be hired for three years. All of these costs, so these 159 gold, are up front. They have no monthly maintenance. So if I pay 159 for the Band of the Horn because I don't have enough archers or bodyguards of Gwendolyn because I don't have enough pikemen for 199 I pay 199 which I can afford, and I'm making a decent amount of income there. There's no more monthly income. That's it. For three years, you got freebies. You paid the money, you have them. So all costs are up front with no monthly maintenance. Be strategic about them. And as far as finances go, you can go into debt for hiring them, but up to two years. I did that here with Brittany. I was actually um, in a crusade, and then I had some of my counts here uh, raise an army against me. Uh, my crusading army kind of got their asses kicked. But then I decided to hire a ton of mercenaries. I went about 100 gold into debt. I had a force that was better than what I was facing. And as such, I was able to win a war and defeat the rebellion because I had superior forces and superior quality. And they were all mercenaries. And they were so good, in fact, that I was then able to still use them for two more years and conquer the rest of Normandy after um, a few things happened here that allowed them to be weak and me to take over them. I had about 7,000 soldiers, about half of who were, uh, half of whom were mercenaries. So mercenaries are a, a vital part of CK3. Again, no monthly cost is the huge thing. If you can afford them, use them. I mean, if we look here at three, if I was in a pinch right now, getting absolutely crushed uh, by a superior force, I could go and spend 355 gold. I have the money. 1,700 soldiers come in, and a big chunk of them are light horsemen and light footmen. So immediately I have a good skirmisher and good cavalry, and it costs me 355, but then I have no more costs. I mean, they're really cheaper even than raising your own army. The difference is when they're gone, they're gone, whereas your guys will always reinforce them afterwards, and you have them back. 
So mercenary is very important, but be strategic. Now the next one right here, don't have one to show you right now, but holy orders. Now these are independent military organizations that can be created by you or anybody else in the game. Now they're created by a ruler. They cost 500 gold, 1,000 piety, and then the lease of a holding, city or castle. I personally recommend a castle because cities are a great place for development and money. But putting them in a castle is very important. Now, they can be hired for a war versus either a hostile or evil faith. They cost piety to hire, instead of gold, unless you are the patron. If you are the patron, they don't cost you anything. They cost you the 500 gold and the 1,000 piety up front, as well as a holding the lease. And after that, you can hire them. So if you go on a crusade, bring in your Holy Order warriors as well. So that's another unit that's not as flexible as your own armies or mercenaries, but if it is called Crusader Kings, if you're on crusade, they can be quite helpful. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, I'm going to raise my armies here real quick, is this gentleman right here who's a bit of a giant, actually. He is literally a giant, so that gives him a huge prowess bonus, which is kind of fun to have. But you have your commander. Now, commanders are very, very important. Now, you can have one command, command, commander per army. They're auto-assigned, but you can manually change it just by clicking this here, select a new commander, and pick someone you want. Now, our giant here, as you can see, <clears throat> he's a military engineer. So the siege phase time, minus 30%. Again, we're going to win a lot of sieges. But you have Père de Bretagne, who's one of our knights, who also has a high prowess, is a holy warrior and reckless. Reckless eh, has some advantages and disadvantages. And Arthel, he is an open terrain expert and an organizer. He would be the better option. Lower prowess skill, but that doesn't matter. He has the better commander traits. So that's the key thing here on commanders. You can also split your armies and then add another commander and so on. Key thing here, try and, and important here are also martial skills help with your commander. That's very important. So martial skills and traits are very, very key. Um, and you have your advantage because of 21 because of a martial skill of plus 21. So again, martial skill here, more important than prowess. So you could pick someone whose prowess isn't that high, but who has great martial skill and excellent attributes to be one of your army commanders. And try not to have key people as commanders like you or your heir. I have used myself as an army commander because all my other commanders were trash and my ruler was just fantastic. But it's not really something I would recommend because if you get captured, the war is 100% war score and done and over. If you die... The war is over as well, plus, uh, well, you, you know, die, and you don't want to die. Now, the other thing is, of course, if you have a capable son who you don't really like, or a capable person at court who you don't really like, or he doesn't even have to be capable, you just don't like him. Put him as an army commander, create a small army, and send them out there in the hopes that they get destroyed, and he dies. It's not exactly the nicest thing to do, but it is something you could do. Now, there are, to kind of round this out, there are a couple of things I still need to talk about. One, attrition. Attrition is a loss of troops due to besieging, looting, no supplies, or when moving through hostile counties that A, only border hostile counties, and or B, are not coastal. So again, attrition is a key thing. So if you move your army, you're at war with France, and I move them right here in the middle, you're going to suffer attrition, and that means your troops are going to keep going down bit by bit. Supply is another one. Low supply or no supply gives negative modifiers to unit stats in combat. Supply limit is dependent upon barony, where army is located, its development level, and the terrain. The commander with the trait living off the land perk gives a boost to the army's supply carrying capacity, so from 100 to 300. So you run out of supply later, and again, no supplies also leads to attrition. If you're besieging, you will deal with attrition. If you are looting, you will deal with attrition because the basically the, the mechanic there is there's a garrison that's fighting against you, there are locals that are fighting against you, so people will die. But obviously, if you have no supplies, you're going to suffer heavy attrition, 
and very heavy modifiers if you go into an engagement. Now, modifiers, tenants, and traits can reduce the amount of attrition. So, a very important trait here to look for in a commander is the Reaver trait. This is the best one as it reduces attrition amount by 75%. So anyway, that is it for this guide, part one in the military guide, where I focused on armies, units, commanders, and knights. In part two, I will get into combat and wars, as well as some strategical aspects of warfare and armies and so forth. We'll talk about raiding and looting and timing of wars and so on. So if you enjoyed this guide, please don't forget to hit the like button, uh, subscribe if you're new to not miss anything, and check out the links down in the description to Discord, Twitch, Twitter, and Patreon. So until next time, I'm Realm Builder Guy, and I'll talk to you soon.